Well, we are in the 23rd session of our review of the book of Genesis. In a sense, we're going to finish the book tonight except for one chapter. In chapter 49, Jacob will prophesy over the 12 tribes, over his sons. And we're going to hold that back for the final session next time because that's also a good occasion to not just cover those verses, but to do a more comprehensive review of the 12 tribes, not just historically, but prophetically. So by making that its own session, it makes sense, I think, to use it as a trailer of, of, on the whole thing. So we're going to go uh, through um, the, uh, uh, the family now is in Egypt, obviously. Jacob uh, is with them. Joseph, we, last time we had this incredibly dramatic, touching scene where Joseph <laughs> presents himself to his brothers. And uh, that's a passage you can just read and not fail to be touched by. And of course, as you really uh, uh, embrace the humanity of all involved, that has to be one of the great scenes in history. But at this point, we, the, the family is in Egypt. We'll take chapters 46 through 50, holding back 49 for our final session. Now, as I say, we've had three sessions on Joseph, 21, 22, and 23. So this is the third of those sessions. And uh, we're going to chapter 46, they'll journey to Egypt. And in 47, Jacob's family will be honored by the Pharaoh and so forth. We have a very important chapter in 48, where Joseph's two sons, born in Egypt, are adopted by his father. We need to understand what that really means. And the final session, 49, we'll hold back, as I say. And then, of course, the last chapter, which closes the book of Genesis, is the death of Jacob and so forth. And so, so we're in chapter 46, Jacob and, and, and uh, journeys to Egypt. Chapter 46, verse 1, and Israel, notice the word there. We call him Jacob most of the time, but you'll notice when the word Israel is there, it's a, it's a compliment. And Israel took his journey with all that he had and came to Beersheba, and offered sacrifices unto the God of his father Isaac. And God spake unto Israel in the visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob. You know, it's interesting. You girls, you've noticed that you always have to tell a man twice. <laughs> Did you know that's scriptural? You know, is that Eli, Eli, you know, and so forth. So it's scriptural. And he said, here am I. And he said, I am God, the God of thy father. Fear not to go down into Egypt, for I will there make of thee a great nation. Now, he's left Hebron. He, they lived in Hebron, and, and uh, his first stop was in Beersheba, which is, this is in, is in route on the way there. And he gives sacrifice, which is a style. It's, uh, people talk of his altered life, A-L-T-A-R, uh, altered life. He, he does altars and, and so forth. And this is where Isaac had lived and uh, where uh, Jacob left to escape Esau, you may recall. And uh, it's also uh, uh, where Jacob received that vision at night, uh, the Lord at night. And so God is meeting him here for the seventh time, by the way, if you've been counting. It was chapter 28 and 30, a couple of times, 31, 32, uh, 35, twice, and so forth. So he, he meets with him seven times. Anyway, um, God continues, says, I will go down. Instead, he's, he's telling him, don't fear to go down to Egypt, because remember, he was told not to before, or his father was also told not to before. I will, I will go down with thee into Egypt, and I will also surely bring thee up again, and Joseph shall put his hand upon thine eyes. So God is reiterating his promise to him that his family would be a great nation and that he would bring that nation back from Egypt ultimately. And uh, the, uh, 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 he also, uh, this is comforting. Because he's, he's telling you that he's going, to die, he's going to die in peace. And his son Joseph will close his eyes is really what he's, what he's saying here. So in verse 5, J Jacob rose up from Beersheba and the sons of Israel carried Jacob their father and their little ones and their wives in the wagons which Pharaoh had sent to carry him. It's interesting to sense as we go through this whole thing, the participation, not just of Joseph naturally because he's family, but Pharaoh himself. You're going to see all kinds of uh, open, uh, overt but also subtle indications of how Joseph was revered by the Egyptians. Understand, their background was to uh, uh, disdain the Hebrews. They didn't, the culture was such that they were uh, uh, a despised group. But 
They overcame all of that because of Joseph. And not, and not just in deference to Pharaoh, they, he really had earned his spurs. He saved the nation and a major part of the world with his stewardship and uh, so forth. So he's very venerated. But it's interesting to be sense as we go here how Pharaoh himself is participating in helping this family get relocated uh, into Goshen and so forth. And they took their cattle and their goods, by the way, which were substantial, presumably, the ones that survived the famine, their goods, and which they had gotten in the land of Canaan. They came into Egypt, Jacob, and all his seed with him. And here's a map to give you a rough idea of where they were in Hebron. And uh, Beersheba is probably, I imagine, about a third of the way and, uh, to, uh, to Goshen. And uh, his sons and his sons' sons with him, his daughters and his sons' daughters, and all his seed brought he with him into Egypt. And these are the names of the children of Israel which came into Egypt, Jacob and his sons, Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, and the sons of Reuben, Hanak, Falu, Hezron, and Carmi. And the sons of Simeon, Jemuel and Jamin, and Ohad, and Yachin, and Zohar, and Shaul, the son of a Canaanitish woman. And the sons of Levi, Gershon, Kohath, and Merari. And the sons of Judah, Er, and Onan, and Shelah, and Perez, and Zerah. But Er and Onan died in the land of Canaan. In other words, they're listed here for completeness, but they had passed away by this time. They passed. Remember that was that, that's what Genesis 38 was all about, with you know the, the situation, the background of Tamar and that sordid business. And the sons of Perez were Hezron and Hamul, and the sons of Issachar, Tola, and Fuva, and Job and Shimron, and the sons of Zebulun, Sarad and Elon and Yahiel. And uh, these be the sons of Leah, which she bare unto Jacob in Padar Aram and his daughter Dinah, and all the souls of his sons and his daughters were 33. And the sons of Gad, this is going to be summarized for you in a minute, so you don't have to be counting here, but anyway, the sons of Gad, <coughs> Ziphion and Haggai and uh, Shuni and Esbon, Eri, Arodai and Areli, and the sons of Asher, Jimna and Yeshua and Isui and Beriah and Zerah their sister, and the sons of Beriah, Heber and Malachiel. And these are the sons of Zilpah, whom Laban gave to Leah, his daughter, and these she bare unto Jacob, even sixteen souls. And the sons of Rachel, Jacob's wife, Joseph and Benjamin. And unto Joseph in the land of Egypt were born Manasseh and Ephraim, which Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, the priest of On, bare unto him. Now these two guys we're going to talk about in the subsequent chapter, it will be quite significant for lots of reasons. And the sons of Benjamin were Bela and Becker and Ashbel, Gera and uh, Naaman, Ehi and Rosh, Mupin and Hupin and uh, Ard. Sounds like a musical group, doesn't it? You, you always see these Christian music groups looking for new names. They, I wonder if they've overlooked this one. That's a, that looks like a dandy. You get a lot about us and buzz. That's in another area. But, but Muppin and Huppin, I, I think that, that, that sounds like it's got rhythm, man. That's all right. These are the sons of Rachel, which were born to Jacob. All the souls were 14. And the sons of Dan, Hushim. Now, let me mention something here that you won't find in the commentaries. Because when you read this, it sounds like Hushim is the son of Dan. And that it may be, but there's another view. The word is a plural, and it's equivalent to our English and others. One of the things, one of the mysteries of the biblical text that apparently starts here but goes right through the biblical text, and we'll talk about this next time as we talk about the tribes, you can draw the, you can get the impression, you can draw the inference that the Holy Spirit has something against Dan. You notice this very conspicuously when you get to the book of Revelation. In chapter 7 you have 12 tribes sealed for protection. But if you read that carefully, you'll discover there's a tribe missing. That's why it's so important for you to understand there's really 13 to talk about. But when you, in fact, there's actually two tribes missing. Most people miss this. I'll to explain why. First of all, the tribe of Dan is conspicuous. That's not mentioned. It's not sealed. It's not protected. 
It has to survive the tribulation without that protection, apparently, or the leader does. Um, they do survive it because they are the first tribe to inherit when the land is again granted them in the millennium. But that's because he's going from north to south and they're in the north. So, but, um, so you, the, the, the general view is, is that Dan is not mentioned there because it's the tribe through which idolatry entered the land. And that's in a sense of judgment to it. What many people miss, there's another tribe missing too, but it's there by inference because in the list, Manasseh is mentioned and then later, Joseph. Well, wait a minute. Joseph is Manasseh and Ephraim put together. If you already got Manasseh, what's left? Ephraim. So Ephraim's there, but not by name, by inference. So you get there again, Dan and Ephraim are the, the bad guys, idol worshiping wise, when you get to the northern kingdom and all that business. So, so, but when you stand back from the scripture, you'll also notice there's a number of places where the tribes are listed in various, in fact, the 12 tribes are listed 20 times in the Bible, each time in a different order, each time with a different one missing and so on and so forth. But when you get to Dan, you'll, often there'll be a full genealogy like you have here of all these other guys. When you get to Dan, it's Dan and his guys and moves on, you know. And you know, if you were Dan, you'd say, wait a minute, guys, I'm not getting a fair shake here. So somehow you get that impression. And uh, anyway, and the sons of Natali, um, Yazil and Guni and Jezer and, and Shulam. And there are the sons of Bilhah, which Laban gave to Rachel, his daughter. And she bare these unto Jacob. All the souls were seven. Here's a summary of what we just went through to give you a feeling of it. Because there's a lot of confusion because of different quotes in different places. And I won't go through all of them here, but I just, you'll find that in Acts um, 7, Stephen mentions 75 souls. But he, it's who you're counting and who you're not. See, so it gets complicated. But it's all reconcilable. And uh, uh, obviously, Leah and her children and grandchildren were 33. We went through that. And then there's the 16 of Zilpahs and the 14 of Rachel's and the 7 of Bilhah's. They're grouped as you probably want to group them, Leah and her surrogate and Rachel and her surrogate. Then Dinah, being a gal, is listed separately. And then Ur and Onan are mentioned here for completeness as they are in the text, but they're not counted because they had died before this, this uh, relocation. Joseph and his two sons, however, were already in Egypt, so we take off five for those, and that's how we get the 66. Those who went down to Egypt in verse 26 uh, will be 66. But when you count Joseph, Manasseh, Ephraim, and Jacob, that's four more, that gives you the 70, because you'll also find places in verse 27, for example, where it says there's 70 went down. And if you're just reading this, you can get confused. Is there 66? Is it 70? Or what is Stephen calling with the 75? So don't let it throw you. It's a question of just doing the diligence, laying it out. Are we together? Not a big deal, but don't want you to stumble on that <clears throat> in your own reading. Let's move on. Uh, here it is, verse 26 and 27. All the souls that came with Jacob into Egypt, which came out of his loins, besides Jacob's sons' wives, all the souls were threescore and six. In other words, 66. The sons of Joseph, which were born him in Egypt, were two souls. And all the souls of the house of Jacob, which came into Egypt, were threescore and ten. So if you're just reading that, it sounds like double talk at first, unless you make the list and realize that some were already there and so forth. That's why I give you the reconciliation, which will be in the notes, the supplemental notes that go with us. Okay. And he sent Judah before him unto Joseph to direct his face unto Goshen. And they came into the land of Goshen, which I think, as I mentioned last time, is the eastern portion of the Nile Delta, the most fertile part of the land was where the Nile enters the ocean. There's a very fertile area called the, the Delta, a very large area. The eastern portion of that is, go, is the, we believe, the uh, district of Bramises called that way, called such in the book of Exodus, but it's basically here called Goshen. Um, and uh, it's the Pharaoh earmarked this most choice place for Joseph's family to dwell in. And Joseph made ready his chariot and went up to meet Israel, his father, to Goshen. And presented himself unto him, and he fell on his neck and wept on his neck a good while. Can you imagine this reunion? This reunion. This was his, uh, uh, um, Israel, or Jacob's favorite son. He and, Jen uh, he and Benjamin were the two from Rachel. They had favored treatment. In fact, it was that favored treatment that got Joseph, you know, uh, incurring the envy of his brothers that led to his being uh, a victim of all that mischief. But now they're together. Can you imagine this father and Joseph? He thought he was dead, and he now he discovers he's the ruler of the world. That takes some adjustment, you know. That takes some adjustment. And Israel said to Joseph, 
Now let me die, since I have seen thy face, because thou art yet alive. After 22 years, they're united. And uh, see, the last time Joseph saw his father was when he was 17. And uh, so he's not only satisfied to see his son alive, but to see it also, he was the one that was the designated heir. He was the one from those dreams that was to rule over the family. You know, see, all this, suddenly the fog lifts. These dreams that he spoke about uh, when he was a child are being fulfilled. And it's, a, it's not only a family reunion, it's a confirmation that God delights in making and keeping his promises. That's a characteristic of God we need to understand. It's a characteristic of God that we can rely on. His sense of timing may be a little different than ours, but he is a God that is trustworthy. That makes him distinctive from other presentations of other would-be gods that are presented as capricious and so forth. And Joseph said unto his brethren and unto his father's house, I will go up and show Pharaoh and say unto him, My brethren and my father's house, which were in the land of Canaan, are come unto me. And the men are shepherds, listen to this carefully, for their trade hath been to feed cattle, and they have brought their flocks and their herds and all that they have. Now, it's interesting that he, was, he knew that the Egyptians despised shepherds. So he's emphasizing that they have They do have cattle. He's not lying, but he's emphasizing that they're cattle raisers. They're not, he doesn't present them as sheep herders. His five, five of his brothers did not respond with the same tact and courtesy when we get to chapter 47 and verse 3. But uh, in any case, it shall come to pass when Pharaoh shall call you and shall say, What is your occupation? That ye shall say, Thy servant's trade hath been about cattle from our youth, even until now, both we and also our fathers, that ye may dwell in the land of Goshen, for every shepherd is an abomination unto the Egyptians. So uh, it's not clear that if they'd said that, that Pharaoh would have reneged. That's not the point, but it's a question of courtesy. They've been offered this choice land, so they present themselves in a way that would have the least likely uh, uh, effect of, of uh, you know, uh, insulting their host. And therein lies chapter 46. Let's just go, keep rolling here. Chapter 47, verse 1, And Joseph came and told Pharaoh and said, My father and my brethren and their flocks and their herds and all that they have are come out of the land of Canaan, and behold, they are in the land of Goshen. And he took some of his brethren, even five men, and presented them unto Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said unto his brethren, What is your occupation? And uh, they said unto Pharaoh, Thy servants are shepherds, both we and also our fathers. They said, Moreover, unto Pharaoh, for to sojourn in the land are we come, for thy servants have no pasture for their flocks, for the famine is sore in the land of Canaan. Now therefore we pray thee, let thy servants dwell in the land of Goshen. And Pharaoh spake unto Joseph, saying, Thy father and thy brethren are come unto thee. The land of Egypt is before thee. In the best of the land make thy father and thy brethren to dwell. In the land of Goshen let them dwell. And if thou knowest any men of activity among them, then make them rulers over my cattle. So he's letting them also serve the king. Not just Joseph, who's really like a prime minister, but the king himself. And uh, so it's the, they're getting the, uh, the best of the land, and they're also getting the opportunity to be overseers of the Pharaoh's own herds. And Joseph brought in Jacob, his father, and set him before Pharaoh. <laughs> Get this. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh. That's uh, kind of interesting <laughs> that this old man... On the, on the threshold of the, his, his final days, is blessing Pharaoh. I think that's a long distance from here to the book of Exodus, where it's quite a different relationship. And Pharaoh said to Jacob, how old are you? Jacob said unto Pharaoh, the days of the years of my pilgrimage are 130 years. Few and evil have the days of the years of my life been and have not attained unto the days of the years of the life of my fathers in the days of their pilgrimage. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh and went out from before Pharaoh. And uh, so it's interesting how he speaks of his life. It's a pilgrimage. You know, if we could only adopt that attitude to realize that we are not earth dwellers. We are just passing through. If we had any grasp of how transient, how brief 
the years of our lives are. Not just because they're half of his age, but in general. It's, uh, it's, 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 really, it's, it's uh, really astonishing. The book of Revelation, when you study the book of Revelation, divides, the people there are divided in two groups, really. Those that are in heaven and enjoying all that, and those that are the earth dwellers, those that dwell upon the earth. When you first read that, you assume that's just physical. They're making a distinction between those that are in heaven and those that are physically on the earth. No, it's deeper than that. That phrase you'll discover if you study carefully refers to those who are dwelling on the earth. That's where their heart is. That's where their equity is. That's, and they will be at war with God. One of the strangest things in the whole picture, biblical picture, is that the world will ultimately declare war against God. And you think that's kind of weird, or you think that's just an interpretation of Revelation? No, then look at Psalm 2. Psalm 2 is a, a, a trilogue between the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, discussing this bizarre episode, you know, that the, the uh, kings of the earth take counsel against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let's cast their bonds from us, and so forth. Check it out, very strange. Anyway, if we could just realize how brief our lives are... Um, you know, I, I, I think I may have mentioned, I, I can remember vividly having a relationship with, I was in a business situation with a, a, a Jewish financier, and we were, uh, I, I mentioned him once, I said, Bernie, uh, he was about, yeah, in his mid-50s, I guess. I said, uh, you know, you got, what do you got? You got maybe a thousand weekends, right? And he looked at me shocked, what do you mean? What do you mean? So we'll do the math. You know, three score and ten, that's 20 years, you got 50 weekends a year in round numbers, and so... You know, you got a 50 times 20, it's about what, 1,000 weekends. Really upset him. See, when you say 20 years, that's an academic thing. You know, that's something you read in an insurance contract. I mean, you don't, or, or in, a, in, a, in, a, in a mortgage way. You don't think of it, it doesn't rattle when you shake it, you know. But you turn it into weekends, you ain't got 1,000 weekends. I saw him years later, after many other episodes in his life and mine. He, uh, I happened to see him in a situation. He said, Chuck. What is it now? About 90, 900? You know, I mean, he, I didn't you know what he meant. That I, that I realized he was referring to that little conversation I used just to rattle his cage a little bit. And uh, it's interesting. You know, I, I understand, uh, uh, we didn't do it at the academy, but I understand a lot of college gals will, in college, they'll make a paperclip chain of how many, how many weekends it is till Christmas or to the prom or whatever, and they take one off each day. We didn't do that, but I understand that's a common practice in college. Well, you know, I don't know if you, so you guys should make a paper a clip chain of whatever's left, you know, do your own math. You've got, you, got an age, your insurance age will tell you what at least your expectation is get, in the absence of a surprise. And I, I don't think you should make a paper clip chain, but <laughs> you might recognize that uh, as it gets shorter, they get more precious, you know. <laughs> but uh, here he is. He's, he speaks of his life as a pilgrimage. If we could just keep a light touch and not let our total... Uh, lives center around our earthly uh, commitments. You know, the, the urgent always preempts the important. That's a tragedy. Anyway, Jacob blessed Pharaoh and went out from before Pharaoh. And uh, so the, uh, here they are settled in a foreign land. And Joseph placed his father and his brethren and gave them a possession in the land of Egypt, in the best of the land, in the land of Ramesses, as Pharaoh had commanded. And Joseph nourished his father and his brethren and all his father's household with bread according to their families. And there was no bread in all the land, for the famine was very sore, so that the land of Egypt and all the land of Canaan fainted by reason of the famine. That's the general condition in which they prospered. That's a contrast, do you follow me? It wasn't that everybody had plenty, but they sure did, as you can imagine. And Joseph gathered up all the money that was found in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan, for the corn which they brought, bought. And Joseph brought the money into Pharaoh's house. And when the money failed, now get, you know, understand, see, Joseph, seeing that the, the good years were going to pre be followed by bad years, obviously stored stuff. And that's great. When the bad years came, he didn't give it out. He sold it. And uh, he altered the structure of Egypt. Because before he's through here, you're going to see that Pharaoh will own every, virtually everything. That's the beginning of the taxation there that it goes, continues even to this day, in a sense. So, and money failed in the land of Egypt. They're still hungry, but they ran out of money. 
And in the land of Canaan, it's also included here, all the Egyptians came unto Joseph and said, Give us bread, for why should we die in thy presence? For money faileth. Well, Joseph said, Give your cattle, and I will give you for your cattle if money fail. So they brought their cattle unto Joseph, and Joseph gave them bread in exchange for horses, and for the flocks, and for the cattle of herds, and for the asses. And he fed them with bread for all their cattle for that year. That was good for a year. As I recall, the earlier verse said, what, five years? So he's got a few more to go here. When that year was ended, they came unto him the second year and said unto him, We will not hide it from my Lord how that our money is spent. My Lord also has our herds of cattle. There's not aught left in the sight of my Lord but our bodies and our hands, our, our lands, excuse me. Wherefore shall we die in thine eyes, both we and our land? Buy us in our land for bread, and we in our land will be servants unto Pharaoh, and give us seed that we may live and not die, that the land be not desolate. And Joseph brought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh, and the Egypt's, Egyptians sold every man his field, because the famine prevailed over them. So the land became Pharaoh's. See, jo Joseph's pretty shrewd here. He's taking advantage of the situation in a very businesslike way. And as for the people... He removed them to, the, to cities from one end of the borders of Egypt even to the other end thereof. Only the land of the priests bought he not. For the priests had a portion assigned them of Pharaoh and did eat their portion, uh, their portion which Pharaoh gave them. Wherefore they sold not their lands. And uh, then Joseph said unto the people, Behold, I have bought you this day and your land for Pharaoh. Lo, here is seed for you, and ye shall sow the land. And it shall come to pass in the increase that ye shall give the fifth part unto Pharaoh, and four parts shall be your own, for seed of the field, and for your food, and for them of your households, and for food of your little ones. So what Joseph managed to do is he got, gave Pharaoh, which was a title like a king, but he ended up owning the place, literally. And, uh, and that made them, converted them from equity owners to tenant farmers. But then, and they were taxed 20%, which is pretty modest. If you realize that we get taxed twice that, just at the federal level, not counting all the other stuff it gets on. Uh, I forget, I haven't kept track of what, what, is, what is our breakover date. People, you know, I think it, sometime in June, up till then you're working for the government, then from then on it's for yourself. You, know, you can figure out from how, what your tax burden is, at what point it, it's yours to keep kind of thing. So you can go through that arithmetic. But these people were in bondage to Pharaoh. And uh, I'll, I'll leave you to make whatever analogies you want to make with their situation on our own. We'll move on here. And uh, so, it shall come to pass in the increase that you shall give a fifth part unto Pharaoh, 20%. Four parts will be your own for the seed of the field, for your food, and for, and for them of your households, and food for your little ones. And they said, Thou hast saved our lives. Let us find grace in the sight of my Lord, and we shall be Pharaoh's servants. And Joseph made it a law over the land of Egypt unto this day that Pharaoh should have a fifth part except the land of the priests only, which became not Pharaoh's. And Israel dwelt in the land of Egypt, in the country of Goshen, and they had possessions therein and grew and multiplied exceedingly. And Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years. And in the whole age of Jacob was 147 years. And time drew nigh that Israel must die. And he called his son Joseph and said unto him, If now I have found grace in thy sight, put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh, and deal kindly and truly with me. Bury me not, I pray thee, in Egypt. But I will lie with my fathers, and thou shalt carry me out of Egypt, and bury me in their burying place. And he said, I will do as thou hast said. <clears throat> We've already noticed that one of the ways of making a sacred commitment to someone was the hand under the thigh gesture as a as a, a form of, of, of serious, reverent commitment. And that's what uh, Jacob extracts from Joseph. He wants to be buried with his fathers. And, uh, and they will comply with that. And he said, swear unto me. And he swore unto him. And Israel bowed himself upon the bed's stead, the head, bed head. So that brings us to chapter 48. And we have a very important little event here. It's just a little event, and yet it's very, very significant for Israel's history. 
Chapter 48, verse 1, it came to pass after these things that one told Joseph, Behold, thy father is sick, and he took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. Manasseh is the firstborn. He's the elder. And Ephraim is second of the two. And one told Jacob and said, Behold, thy son Joseph, Joseph cometh unto thee, and Israel strengthened himself and sat upon his bed. Visualize he's, he's on a sick bed. He's sick. He's all aged. He's just, who knows, not far from his final hour. So he's sitting up in dead to bed to receive his son Joseph. Jacob said unto Joseph, God Almighty appeared unto me at Luz, the place that he renamed Bethel, you may recall, in the land of Canaan, blessed me. And he said to me, Behold, I will make thee fruitful and multiply thee, and I will make of thee a multitude of people, and will give this land to thy seed after thee for an everlasting possession. So he's recounting, again, this commitment God reconfirmed to him. And now thy two sons, he's, this is Jacob refer, talking to Joseph, thy two sons Ephraim and Manasseh, which were born unto thee in the land of Egypt before I came unto thee into Egypt, are mine, as Reuben and Simeon, they shall be mine. He is doing more than just blessing them, as we would say. He is legally adopting them as his own. They will be on equivalent peer with his firstborn, Reuben. And Simeon and the rest. So despite their parentage from the direct um, wives, Leah and Rachel, or the handmaids, whatever, they're going to be these two sons, which are, we would call them, there's no word for that in the, in the Aramaic or the Hebrew, we call them grandsons. They're going to be, in effect, elevated as if they were Jacob's own sons. Now the reason he can do that, what, the reason this all fits so nicely is by Joseph acceding to the role of the firstborn, by the forfeiture of the previous guys. Reuben had his problems and so forth. I won't go through all that again. We did that before. Um, so Joseph's entitled to a double portion because of his posture as the first. See, the word firstborn, be careful of this. It helps you in other passages. The word firstborn doesn't just mean he's born first. He was The firstborn was born first, but the word firstborn is a title of position that sometimes will pass to the second or others. They're called the firstborn, not because they're born first, but because they are entitled to be in charge, have the double portion, etc. Do you follow me? And it's astonishing to make a list of how often God chooses to, to change the order. And uh, uh, we went through, we had a list of that also in the past. But, so, but here in this case, you want you to understand the, uh, that um, Ephraim and Manasseh will both be um, and notice the in order he puts it, Ephraim and Manasseh. They're born Manasseh and Ephraim. Manasseh was the oldest. He says, Jacob says, they are mine as Reuben and Simeon. Understand the significance of that. They shall be mine. And thy issue, which thou begettest after them, shall be thine, and shall be called after the name of their brethren in their inheritance. As for me, when I came from Padan, Rachel died by me in the land of Canaan in the way, when yet there was but a little way to come to Ephrathah. Ephrath. Ephrathah is the region where Bethlehem is, and uh, obviously. And I buried her there in the way of Ephrathah. The same is Bethlehem. And when you visit Bethlehem, should you do that, it's usually a pretty troubled place because of the Arab tensions in that region. Um, but there is a place called Rachel's Tomb. Now, whether it's actually her tomb or not, as some scholars will debate, but in any case, it's highly venerated by the Jewish community for the obvious reasons. And so... And Israel beheld Joseph's sons. He said, Who are these? And Joseph said to his father, They are my sons whom God hath given me in this place. And he said, Bring them, I pray thee, unto me, and I will bless them. Now the eyes of Israel were dim for age, so that he could not see. I can't help but remember when uh, his father, Isaac, was taken advantage of when his eyes were dim and couldn't see. But anyway, and he brought them, near, anyway, uh, Joseph, he brought them near to him, and he kissed them, and he embraced them. And Israel said unto Joseph, I had not thought to see thy face, and lo, God hath shown me also thy seed. In other words, I didn't expect to see you. This, to be able to see your offspring is just, you know, it's an extra blessing. So Joseph brought them out from between his knees, and he bowed himself with his face to the earth. And Joseph took them both, Ephraim, in his right hand, toward, toward Israel's left hand. Get the picture here, it's important. And Manasseh in his left hand, toward Israel's right hand. 
and brought them near to him. I want you to picture yourself as if you're, you know, Israel or Jacob. And understand that Ephraim is in his right hand towards Israel's left hand. So Israel's left hand is towards Ephraim, which is the second born. And right is, yeah, Manasseh. They were got right. Okay. Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it on Ephraim's head, who was the younger, and his left hand upon Manasseh's head, guiding his hands wittingly. For Manasseh was the firstborn. In other words, he crosses his hands deliberately. This is going to upset Joseph because he thinks he's making a big mistake. He thinks the old man's got this, you know, he's, he's, he's uh, not playing with all his marbles or something. He's, he's, he's worried about it. And he blessed Joseph and said, God, before whom the, my fathers Abraham and Isaac did walk, the God which fed me all my life long unto this day, the angel which redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads and let my name be named on them and the name of my fathers Abraham and Isaac and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. That's his blessing. When Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand upon Ephraim, it displeased him. He thought this was a mistake. He's got the, he's got the younger one getting the primary blessing is the, is the implication here. It displeased him. And he held up his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head unto Manasseh's head. And Joseph said unto his father, Not so, my father, for this is the firstborn. Put thy right hand upon his head. Got the picture? The father refused. He knew what he was doing. He said, I know it, my son. I know it. He also shall become a people, and he also shall be great. But truly his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his seed shall become a multitude of nations. That's Ephraim. We'll talk in great depth about it in the next session. That's why I want to reserve chapter 49 for a session in its own right. But Ephraim not only grows to be a multitude, but it become, he becomes idiomatic of the whole northern kingdom when it, after the civil war between Jeroboam and Rehoboam. We'll go through that next time. Anyway, Jacob, he blessed him that day, saying, In thee shall Israel bless, saying, God make thee as Ephraim and Manasseh. And he set Ephraim before Manasseh. And Israel said unto Joseph, Behold, I die. But God shall be with you and bring you again unto the land of your fathers. Moreover, I have given to thee one portion above thy brethren, which I took out of the hand of the Amorite with my sword and with my bow. By the way, the word for um, uh, portion happens to be Shechem. as a word play here on Shechem, you may recall, the town, remember, so forth. And uh, later Joseph would be buried in Shechem as a sign that he pos that possessed this bequeathed land. See, not only does uh, well, Jacob, they'll take him up there and bury him, but later on when Joseph dies, and that'll happen in the book of Exodus, they'll take his, he will have died there, but they'll, one of the things they do when they, in the Exodus is bring the, the, the mummified body of Joseph and bury him uh, there also. So the, uh, it's interesting, there's an allusion here in verse 22 that there's no record of in the Bible. The, uh, apparently, Jacob had uh, conquered a portion of land from the Amorites, that's the hill country of Canaan, if you will. And although this is the only mention of it uh, in the Bible. And he apparently dug a well there. And uh, this is the well at Sychar, which is mentioned in John, New Testament, in John chapter 4. But uh, we don't know anything about the background. It doesn't seem to fit what we think we do know, so it's just the only illusion we have. So, so ends that chapter. Now, what happens in chapter 49, just for your sense of continuity here, Jacob, in this aged, sickly state, is on his bed, but also leaning on his staff. That's confusing. You visualize, but he's doing both, um, apparently. But uh, he, having done this, will now bless each of the 12 sons. And he does that with what you and I would consider riddles. Strange little passages that are very enigmatic at first. The longest one, naturally, would be on Judah, because that's the royal line, very messianic. And rather than go through this here where we'd have to sort of hurry to keep it within a reasonable time on this session, we've reserved the last session just for that chapter and a wrap-up of the book. So we'll go through in the next session each, each of the things that Jacob does as he blesses, but then we'll also try to give you a little perspective of the 12 tribes. And I can tell you, I think we'll have some surprises for most of you. There's some things in the Bible that will startle you if you've never seen them before, and that'll be kind of fun. But to wrap up the book then, rather than have this tag after that, I thought we'll just finish the book tonight with chapter 50, which ties off the book of Genesis, and uh, we'll just treat the chapter 49 as a trailer, if you will, okay? 
So chapter 50, verse 1, let's skip 49 for now. <laughs> chapter 50, verse 1, And Joseph fell upon his father's face and wept upon him and kissed him. And Joseph commanded his servants that the physicians, the, his servants, the physicians, to embalm his father. And the physicians embalmed Israel. That's a process, by the way, that takes 40 days. That's not a quick, quick thing. And, uh, and 40 days were fulfilled for him, for so fulfilled the days of those which are embalmed. And the Egyptians mourned for him three score and ten year, uh, day, three, or, three score and ten days. Uh, in other words, two and a half months. And uh, just two days short of the normal time for mourning of a pharaoh. In other words, the pharaoh, a pharaoh was just only two days longer. So you, they're, they're honoring him in a way that's not at all subtle. They're, they're, this is, they're, they're, this is a, you know, this is like a 20-gun salute or something. You know, not quite 21, you follow me, but close. And this just is, it, it's intended, I think, to show the respect they had for Joseph. I mean, Jacob was his father, so he's getting a derived respect. But the real focus, I think, of the Egyptian uh, homage was, was to Joseph, doing it for his benefit. And when the days of his mourning were past, Joseph spake unto the house of Pharaoh, saying, If now I have found grace in your eyes, speak, I pray you, in the ears of Pharaoh, saying, My father made me swear, saying, Lo, I die, in my grave which I have digged for me in the land of Canaan, there thou shalt bury me. Now therefore let me go up, I pray thee, and bury my father, and I will come again. This is more than just a sentimentality of a, of a patriarch. He is really, in effect, underscoring the fact that that land, the land of Canaan, was their commitment, that they would return there. And that was the, the, the commitment God made to Abraham in Genesis 12, 15, and 17. It's in, in effect in all three places in various ways. It's fascinating for us to recognize this because that is what the world is challenging as we speak. All this uh, nonsense that is uh, all this mythology and falsehoods that is continually echoed through the press about that land is the world's way of trying to undo or ignore or uh, deny the land grant that God gave Abraham and his descendants. I should say even Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and their descendants, to be even more precise. And so one of the things that's going to, it's going to continue to be very difficult for Israel for lots of reasons, that's what the Bible makes very clear, but we should not fear because God's hand is on that land. We should pray for Israel. We should pray for God's purpose for Israel, knowing that God predicts their ultimate victory there. They will not be removed. Attempts to remove them will not succeed. People say, Chuck, don't you worry about Israel? No, I don't. I pray for them, but I don't worry about it. Why? Because God's hand is on it. I worry about America because that's not as clear. Our destiny will derive from our obedience. And if you, if you, by that measure, Thomas Jefferson said it well. You know, I tremble for my country when I recall that God is just, and his justice will not sleep forever. So that's a whole other thing I won't spend time here on, but I think we need desperately to pray for this country. And, uh, well, as long as I open, the, open this door, I'll mention one other thing. There is a passage in 2 Chronicles 7.14 that was given to Solomon. God appeared to Solomon because Solomon was in the process of dedicating his temple and, and, and uh, God there gives Solomon a promise that denotatively, narrowly speaking, refers to Israel. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, forgive their sin and heal the land, period. That applies to Israel, absolutely. But I believe God changes not and he announces a principle there how many of you in this audience are God's people? I won't ask how many of you are called by his name because some of you probably are the best undercover Christians the world's ever seen. The people at work, the people in your neighborhood and your family don't even suspect you're sold out to Christ. If you are on trial for being a Christian, there might not be enough evidence to convict you, right? So I won't put that, you know, but what, what, what God says is, if my people who are called by my name, I, I, I maintain that in the broader sense, we can claim that as a principle. That's us. Okay, if we do four things, God will do three. If my people are called by my name will humble themselves, we know how to do that. I won't ask the most humble person here to raise their hand. I won't do that to you. <laughs> if my people are called by my name will humble themselves, we know how to do that. We may not do it enough, but we understand that. And pray, we know how to pray. 
We enjoy a 24-hour hotline to the throne room of the universe if we just use it more. He's anxious to hear from us. There are no hours, day and night. If my people are called by the name of humble themselves and pray and seek my face. Now, that's not an intellectual thing. You don't get that by matriculating an academic course or something. That's a commitment thing. That's an emotional. That's a, that's a volitional thing. That's the kind of thing you aspired to when you were courting your spouse. See his face. If my people are called by the name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. Ah, here's the rub. And turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven. Apparently not until then. And forgive their sin, praise God. And heal their land. Now, what's interesting about that passage is that passage is not addressed to the pagan left of this, that are controlling this country. That's not addressed to the media, the Hollywood producers that export all the pornography. It doesn't, it's not addressed to the Congress. It's addressed to the body of Christ. It doesn't take a wholesale revival coast to coast in this country. Less than 3% found it in the first place. Founded it. And what a job they did, boy. If my people are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my faith and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal the land. You know, it's interesting that it's our sin that stands in the way of what God really would prefer to do. I believe he'd prefer America to endure, to be a beachhead for the gospel to a hurting world. What's in the way is us. How did Pogo put it? I bet the enemy, I bet the enemy and it's us. We're the problem. And we want a revival in this country. Let's begin with us personally and see what God does. Verse 5, my father made me swear, saying, Lo, I die in my grave, which I have digged for me in the land of Canaan. There shalt thou bury me. Now, therefore, let me go, I pray thee, and bury my father, and I will come again. And Pharaoh said, Go up and bury thy father according as he has made thee swear. And Joseph went up to bury his father, and with him went all the servants of Pharaoh. Wow. The elders of his house, and all the elders of the land of Egypt. What a procession that must have been. Can you imagine? And all the house of Joseph and his brethren and his father's house, only their little ones and their flocks and their herds that they left in the land of Goshen. Man. And there went up with him both chariots and horsemen. It was a very great company. I can imagine. Egypt ruled that region of the world. And um, the, 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 the spectaculars you see in movies often probably don't tell a half of it. And... Uh, and they came to the thrashing floor of Atad, which is beyond Jordan, and there they mourned with a great and very sore lamentation. And he made a mourning for his father seven days. And when the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, saw the mourning in the floor of the Atad, they said, This is a grievous mourning, a grievous, a grievous mourning to the Egyptians. Wherefore the name of it was called Abel Matraim, which is beyond Jordan. And, uh, which is the mourning of the Egyptians, Mitzurim being the, the, uh, the, the term, the tribal term, uh, all through the scripture for Egypt. And his sons did uh, uh, unto him according as he had commanded them. And uh, now, the, it really means the meadow of the Egyptians, but it's a, it's a wordplay here of, of a mourning. It's a very similar word. And uh, the, 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 the two words for meadow and a place of mourning are just a subtle vowel. And uh, so it's a wordplay again. But the Canaanites, in other words, recognize something's up because here's the Egypt. All the muscle, all the pomp, all the ceremony of Egypt laid out for this burial. They're really buzzing. And what was this all about? For his sons carried him into the land of Canaan and buried him in the cave of the field of Machpelah, which Abraham bought with a field for a possession of a burying place of Ephron the Hittite before Mamre. And Joseph returned unto, uh, into Egypt, he and his brethren, and all that went up with him to bury his father after he had buried his father. And uh, so this is back to Egypt. The fourth time that the majority of the brothers made this journey. And of course, it was Joseph's second trip, right? A little bit different than the first one he made as a slave uh, to, to the slave market. And when Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they panicked totally. No, that's what I said. Pretty much. Can you imagine? See, Dad's dead now, and if he harbors any bad feelings, it's going to surface now. That's their mindset. 
When Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph will peradventure hate us and will certainly requite us all the evil which we did unto him. And they sent a messenger, not personally, they sent a messenger to Joseph, saying, Thy father did command before he died, saying, So shall ye say unto Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass of thy brethren and their sin, for they did unto thee evil. And now we pray thee, Forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of thy father. And Joseph wept when they spake unto him. And his brethren also went and fell down before his face. And they said, Behold, we be thy servants. They're fulfilling those dreams in a very personal way here. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for am I in the place of God? Boy, if we could remember that. We all harbor resentments, unforgiveness in a lot of directions, usually right, right close in the family, of some, for something. If we could just, re there are marriages that we're in touch with that are falling apart because there is not a spirit of forgiveness between the pair for real or imagined things. And the most dangerous hurts are the real ones. The most dangerous hurts, I learned this in Nan's research, is it? the most dangerous hurts are the justified ones. The ones that aren't justified, you can sort of talk out. The ones that are really justify the ones you hang on to. That's why they're dangerous. And Joseph says, fear not, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day, to save much people alive. What a perspective. How important it is for us to be able to have that perspective even when we don't know God's plan. God doesn't deign upon himself to let us in on all he's doing. It's a, it's a, every day, God finds a new way to ask you a question. Do you trust me? And I suspect that the greatest blessing, as, as is echoed in Hebrews 11, by the way, is Joseph, through all these years, sold into slavery, into Egypt, into prison, etc., was a trust in God. He didn't know that. He didn't know what was going to happen. He didn't know he was going to be prime minister of the country in one day, for crying out loud. But he trusted God. That's faith. And faith is not blind trust. Faith isn't believing something just because you're told to believe it. No, faith is simply trusting God, for crying out loud. Is there anyone you can't, is there anyone that you can trust more? Now, therefore, fear ye not. I will nourish you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spake kindly to them. And Joseph dwelt in Egypt, he and his father's house. And Joseph lived 110 years. And Joseph saw Ephraim's children of the third generation. And the children also of Micah, the son of Manasseh, were brought up upon Joseph's knees. What a joy. And Joseph said unto his brethren, I die. And God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land unto the land which he sware to Abraham, Isaac, and to Jacob. And Joseph took an oath of the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and ye shall carry up my bones from hence. So Joseph died, being 110 years old, and, and they embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. And there closes the book of Genesis. The Je book of Genesis opens up with the creation of the universe. Let there be light. And it closes with the coffin in Egypt. It's interesting, Joseph extracts here a commitment from them just as his father extracted a commitment from him before he died. He wanted to be buried in the land that God... This is not a question of sentimentality. This is a question of conforming to God's commitment to them. Now, there is an exercise um, that uh, uh, we want to talk... Well, I'll, I'll talk about... First, I want to emphasize what we have here is um, in the book of Genesis is man's failure, Genesis 3, and the beginning of God's elaborate program to extract us from the penalty of man's failure. They went down there as a family. We've seen them come down as a family. What the next book in the Bible, the book of Exodus, brings them out as a nation. But they're going to go through a cauldron. They'll go through a cauldron before that happens. Four centuries of a cauldron. But there's something else. If we were doing a course here, or you wanted, if you wanted to get, take an exercise, 
you might take a little notebook as you go review through the book the many different ways that Joseph is sort of an anticipatory type of Jesus Christ. We've talked about that in Genesis 22, how Abram and Isaac was the father. It was an anticipatory type of the crucifixion. That very, that very spot that Abram offered Isaac, another father did offer his son as an offering for sin. So that's called a type or, a, or an anticipatory model, right? In what ways was Joseph a type of uh, Christ? Well, they were both, they're both shepherds, right? In fact, uh, Abel, J uh, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, David were all shepherds by background. And who is the good shepherd? Jesus Christ. Well, okay, that, that'll, that'll fit. It's interesting that both had a distinctive vestment, whether it's a coat of many colors or long sleeves. I won't get into, into all that again. But we do know that it was distinctive enough that they, uh, it, it was, in, remember, in chapter 37. But when you get to Psalm 22 or Matthew 37, you notice that one of the aspects of the cross, one of the, of the many details I might mention, one of the mentions that they departed his garments, but they cast lots for the special robe that he had. He was hated of his brethren. That's what John 1, 1 11 says. He came to his own, his own received him not. But as many as did receive him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. He was hated because of who he was and because of his words. Joseph was. So was Christ. Well, that's kind of interesting. His future sovereignty was foretold. Certainly Joseph's was. Remember those dreams? And, it, and same thing with, with uh, 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 Christ's. All through the Old Testament, specifically by Gabriel to Mary, he'll sit on the throne of David, and it was the very accusation that he, that, that, that he made when he was under oath before the authorities. Joseph was sent forth by his father. So was Jesus Christ. Joseph sought his brothers until he found them. So does Jesus Christ. Joseph was conspired against by his brothers. So was Jesus Christ. His words were disbelieved. So was Jesus Christ. He was insulted and stripped. So was Jesus Christ. He was cast into a pit. And I infer from the subsequent hints that he was in that pit three days. He was sold. So was Jesus Christ. In fact... We believe Judah negotiated the bargain with the Ishmaelites, and Judas is simply the anglicized Greek for the same name. Isn't that kind of interesting? His blood was presented to his father. So is Jesus Christ. The sin offering we saw modeled in anticipation in Genesis 22 and so forth. Joseph was sorely tempted, but he sinned not. So did Jesus Christ. And where was he tempted? In Egypt, which is idiomatic of the world. So are we. He was falsely accused. So is Jesus Christ. He made no defense when he was accused in chapter 39. That's what Isaiah emphasizes in anticipation too. Anticipation also. He was cast into prison and without a verdict. Joseph was and so was Jesus Christ. He suffers though he was innocent. And there's, all th there's allusions to that in Acts, Psalm 105, Isaiah 53 and so forth. He suffers at the hands of Gentiles, indeed, in chapter 39. But so Joseph did, and so did Jesus Christ, and that's emphasized in Acts 4. And yet he won the respect of his jailer. So did Jesus Christ. He was numbered with the transgressors. Remember Joseph in prison? There were two, right? Where's Jesus Christ on the cross? Between two. Interesting. Just a coincidence. The predictions, of course, came true in both cases, both in Joseph and Jesus Christ. He was seen as a revealer of secrets. Joseph got a new name because of that reason, and so is Jesus Christ. Isaiah mentioned Isaiah 62, that Jesus will receive a new name, and we find that echoed in Revelation 3. In fact, not only does Jesus get a new name in Revelation 3, verse 12, you and I apparently get a new name in Revelation 2, verse 17. And, of course, we talk about the whole counsel of God, and, of course, that's all through the Scripture. So, by the way, uh, well, there's more here, I guess. Uh, he's a wonderful counselor. He's seated on the throne of another. See, he was, Joseph was on Pharaoh's throne, in effect. And, of course, there's a distinction in heaven between the father's throne and the son's throne. The son is on the father's throne, but he's destined to take David's throne. He was exalted because of his personal worthiness of service. Joseph was, and so is Jesus Christ, as emphasized in Philippians 2. Joseph had a Gentile wife given to him. So did Jesus Christ. 
He was 30 years old when he began to work, according to the scripture. So was Jesus Christ. He, Joseph dispensed the bread of life to the whole world. So was Jesus Christ. Joseph's brethren were driven out of their own land. And they were, uh, he was unknown and unrecognized by his brethren. And there's also a seven-year period of Jacob's trouble. You can sort through if you like. Supple uh, with the notes, the supplemental notes, you'll find over a hundred of the. I've just, I've just gleaned a few of the obvious ones. There's over a hundred of these. Arthur W. Pink uh, identifies most of them in his commentary. And we include a summary of those plus some others um, in our, our notes that accompany this. So therein completes our little review of Genesis. As you go back through your notes and as you go back through Genesis, don't lose sight of the fact, beyond the historical narrative and all of that, that buried in it, corner to corner, are allusions to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the most exciting discovery in the book of Genesis, is to see the anticipatory designs in there that echo in advance, echo in advance of what's coming. And uh, we'll reserve next time as sort of a denouement, talking about the 12 tribes, and what they come for, uh, and uh, the, uh, so let's, uh, we will go to the 12 tribes t publicly in chapter 49 for the final session on our next meeting. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Father, we just are charmed by the, the, the drama that you've laid in front of us. The drama, of course, of Joseph and his family and how you've maneuvered so colorfully your program for the 12 tribes and for your plan of redemption. Father, if we would be ever as sensitive and discerning as how you maneuver in our own lives, that we too might keep a light touch on this world that surrounds us. If we conduct our affairs in a diligent manner on the one hand and yet in the acknowledgement that we're just passing through. For we seek a city whose builder and maker is you. We thank you, Father, for this book we thank you that we've enjoyed the privilege of gathering together to review this book. We do pray, Father, that through your Holy Spirit, you would help us discern that which you would have us take away from this study, that would illuminate the path before us, that we might, with the same clarity and the same resolve, walk with you in the paths that you have chosen for us. We also pray, Father, that you would continue to reignite in each of us a hunger and a passion for your word, knowing that whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning that we, through the patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. We thank you, Father, for the lessons that are here. We thank you, Father, for your Holy Spirit to reveal them to us. We do pray, Father, that we each through all of this, would grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that we each might be more fruitful stewards of the opportunities you've placed before us, whether they are in red carpets or whether they're walking barefoot. We just pray, Father, that we would be diligent stewards of what you, would have, what you have vouchsafed into our hands. As we commit ourselves this night into your hands without any reservation in the name of Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.